our speakers today, Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino, reconnect with traditional Ohlone foods and ways that these foods can be made accessible for daily life. They will speak about the immense benefits these foods have, from deeper cultural understanding to stronger health. In listening attentively to testimony from their elders' recollections of Indian foods, they remember and rely on documentation recorded by members of their Indian communities in the 1920s and 1930s. These records have been preserved and provide a crucial link to understanding the value, respect, and love old timers have for these Indian foods. In the process, they developed a deep and personal love for these same foods and how they can heal, empower, and connect to a cultural identity. For Vincent and Louise, the process of decolonializing diet is possible only with a strong foundation of cultural knowledge, especially their Ohlone languages, Chikotrina and Rasmussen. I apologize. <laughs> Leaving together language with traditional foods empowers them to look at these old foods through an indigenous lens, to understand that these are the same foods that people have always eaten. When Vincent and Lewis use language to celebrate these foods, to pray for them, and to converse over them, they are brought closer to the Ohlone ways, and the greater family is collectively strengthened. In this talk, Vincent and Lewis will describe their personal journey and their efforts to help people across California gain an understanding of how the role traditional foods play in the resurgence of traditional California Indian ways. I want to thank Allison, who wrote those words and sent them. I kind of adjusted them a little bit, but they were so perfect that I thought I would read them. Originators of the Cafe Ohlone in Berkeley and the idea of colonializing Ohlone cuisine and fostering holistic community wellness, I present Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino. Orshatu hi makam oyo. Kanak rakat Vince Medina, kanak muek mataresh, kanak rope nomo, kanamu, ekmak nane rakat Louis Trevino. Waka kakun tush taresh. Nesa makrote aramai warep. At kanakini yakmoite nomo. Hoshe warep yakmoite nomo. Hello to you all. What I said to you is my name is Vincent Medina. Hello again for those who heard me the first time. <laughs> and I'm joined here by my partner Louis Trevino. And together we work to keep our Ohlone food strong. We created an organization two years ago called Mak Amham which works to return our foods back to our community and back to our tribes for the wellness of our people, but also to nurture and foster those cultural connections that come with our food that's connected to the land that our people still live in. I also want to acknowledge that I'm a member and a councilman of the Muekma Ohlone tribe, and we're gonna speak about our tribe, the history of our tribe, how we got to this place that we're in right now, but also where we're going in the future. And uh, we're also, I also want to acknowledge where we're at right now, in the land of the Aramai people, and that Pacifica is in the land of the Aramai, that this is an old place that people have been living in for thousands of years. Not my family, because my family's from east of here, but that this place is definitely a settled place, and history didn't start here, just with Portola. <laughs> we're gonna start a, we're gonna start a video a uh, short video that will introduce the cafe so that you could see what the cafe looks like and some of this work uh, in a recent film that was made uh, just last year, or late last year. And then later we're going to go into our presentation. But this is a small segment of an episode that aired on KCET, a PBS affiliate nationwide. And please bear with me just as I get it set up. It's exciting through Makamfam to bring Ohlone foods to the public here. Every other culture is represented in their cuisine here in the Bay Area. It's important that Ohlone oh, no, foods are yeah, also in that space. By having Ohlone foods here today, it makes it inarguable that we are here. There's a contemporary phrase that we have, which is 
Makwara Hashe Derek Makwara Isha Ayu. The ground turned to stone, but the world is still alive. You know, we're in the midst of all this urbanity. We gotta make sense of our world. And it is urban, but the ground is stone. And no matter what, you know, you can never separate us from this place either. We're doing what we can, you know, what we have available. And so sometimes that means creating a cafe space in the back of a bookstore. So everybody knows what our menu is today. To start off, we have a rose hip tea and an elderberry tea, a native green salad, and a dressing of walnut oil and blackberry juice. We have soft boiled quail eggs, acorn soup, one of them with wildflower honey, one of them is left unsweetened, acorn flour brownies. We have venison that's currently being smoked with bay laurel and bay salt from San Francisco Bay shoreline. So, wait, welcome to Nesa Makama. Now let's eat. Cafe Ohlone by Makama Museum is tucked away back patio here at University of Press Bookstore. We're across the street from UC Berkeley, surrounded by all of this activity. Lewis and myself started Makampang, which in Chochenyo language means our food. It's an organization that we started in order to return our traditional Ohlone foods to our families who haven't experienced them in at least two generations. This very place right here could be where our direct ancestors gathered 400 or 500 years ago. And when we're gathering these, these plants again, just getting back into that groove of, of how our people have always done it. This is a laurel. In our language, we call this Sokoti. And Rumsen, Soko. Sokoch. So right here, this is the Charishin in Chochenyo, Charishin in Rumsen, which is the Yerba Buena. This is a herb that we make into a tea it's that quintessential taste of home. When I started working there at Mission Dolores, I really did the most that I could to talk about our strength, our survival, our perseverance, and our continuity as well. Eventually, it just reached a boiling point for me where I realized you know, my time here on Earth can be spent reversing what the mission has done to us. And instead of just talking about those things, this work that we're doing, it's like defying gravity because we're moving against what was supposed to happen. We live in this society right now that's always getting things in an instant, you know, getting food in an instant, you know, whatever we need. And then this like fast food, you know, world that we're living in, you know, slow foods, is trying to buck that trend, and that means eating seasonally. People I don't think understand how decadent and how rich our diet is. You know, we always say that our food is inherently bougie, you know, <laughs> because it just the ingredients on their own. This is a blackberry, yerba buena, they have more of the big sauce, and we will add a little bit of acorn flour to just to thicken it. This is the bay laurel we gathered yesterday. These are quail eggs, Atush Texan in our language. These are going to be soft boiled for three minutes. And we're going to have roasted venison backstrap that's wrapped in yerba buena. We're going to have Lewis's acorn flower brownies, which is something that we made to introduce acorn to our young people. We adapted a brownie recipe to include acorn flour and to use coconut oil rather than butter. For me, I think that our contemporary foods that we're making are foods that, that our people would recognize because they're rooted in everything that's traditional. We don't cook with anything that's, that wasn't here in those pre-contact days. There is always room for creativity, but we also know that there's rules that we have to follow too. With those rules, that means that you know, we have to be steadfast and, and uh, making sure that we don't change things too much because otherwise that changes the nature of what our food is.
today on this Sunday and for coming to listen to the work that we're doing at Cafe Aloni. And again, my name is Mensa Medina, and I'm here with Luis Torino, my partner, and we work together to keep our food strong. But I'm also going to share with you some of the history about our people from our perspective. It's rare that people get to hear directly from Aloni people ourselves, and so we'd like to share with you um, how history has affected our culture, what our culture was like in those old days before pre-contact, before contact with outsiders, but also who we are today as Ohlone people, what our hopes are, some of our hopes for the future, and the work that we're doing right now to keep our culture strong here in this area, well, specifically in the East Bay. And I titled this presentation, Mueke Mu'ula Yalisha. And in our language, it means the Mu'ekla Ohlone people live. I want to start off by sharing this image of my great-grandmother, Mary Archuleta. My great-grandmother, she's somebody who I look to very much as being a hero. I think about her a lot, especially as we work to keep our culture strong. And my great-grandmother, she was somebody who gives me a lot of hope for what's possible. She was born at a time when our tribe had federal recognition meaning that we were a uh, federally recognized sovereign tribe called the Verona Band of Alameda County over in Sinol and Pleasanton in the East Bay. And my great-grandmother was born at a time when our people were around speaking our language, gathering these foods, weaving our baskets, telling our stories, all those old things that have survived through difficult times like the missions and the gold rush, they were still being practiced in my great-grandma's life. She saw those things, and she saw the value of those things. And in her life, she also saw our tribe lose our recognition. She saw our, our tribe have to be forced to, to find ways to survive at a time when the government and also society around us was trying to find ways to destroy indigenous cultures. My great-grandmother, though, she was a fighter, and she found ways to keep all these things alive. She moved from the rancheria, back into our family's oldest area, which is along San Leandro and San Lorenzo Creeks. That's where my great, 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 great grandmother was born. <laughs> That's where I was born at too. That's where I still live at, Lewis too, my whole family. And it's because of her, because she, she wouldn't leave. She wanted to stay put, right where she belonged. She wanted to keep our culture alive. And she was very victorious and successful in doing that. And so today, we can only be able, in my family, to be able to carry on our identity because of her. And so I always start off this presentation with her. Her name is Mary Archuleta. Um, she passed away when I was a teenager, but she's still very much alive in this work that's happening, and guiding this work. And this photo was taken at a time when our tribe was reorganized, and she was a part of reorganizing our tribe, leading a hand in that. And it was taken not too far from where she was born, you see that look on her face? You know, I see her as just being somebody who's victorious in everything that she did. That's the look of victory right there, not of defeat. Makimakmuekma. <laughs> That's how we say we are the Muekma Ohlone people. We are the Muekma Ohlone tribe. But who are we? Who is Muekma? What does that represent? So just, here's a little bit of technical information that's here, and then we're going to get into uh, some of the pre-contact culture traditional culture that we know is still very much alive. But our tribe today, there's over 800 members in our tribe. And our tribe is the direct legal successor to the Verona Band of Alameda County, the federally recognized tribe that our great-grandparents were a part of, that was based in the East Bay, over in Sanol, and then later in Pleasanton. Um, today, uh, the Boekma Ohlone tribe, it's composed of every surviving East Bay and South Bay Ohlone lineage that exist. And all of our ancestors were living together on this federal Indian land, on a rancheria, it's called, over in Sanol, then it moved just um, two miles up to Pleasanton a little bit later. And um, our tribe came together and reorganized in the early 1980s and re re uh, reorganized ourselves with the original members of the Rona Band as the people leading that work. And today, our tribe, we're, uh, we're a tribe that's uh, very much unified, working together to repair our traditional culture, but also working to protect our sovereignty as well. 
but I want to take a big step back. That way people can understand a little bit about who we are before colonization came, but also the things that still continue, who we still are even today. And if you look up at this map right here, you're going to see a series of names. And this is focused on the East Bay, and so I want to uh, be honest about that. But throughout the peninsula, there also would have been a series of different names that are the tribal nations of the San Francisco Peninsula. This is pretty common all throughout California. So if you look at this map, every single name that you see there, every single, every single name is a sovereign, independent microstate, basically a small little nation of its own, with, made up about 200 to 500 people in each one. However, they're all interconnected in these really beautiful ways that I'm going to describe in just a moment. But I'd like to say, first of all, I believe that our world was created in the East Bay. There's a story that our elders still tell us that we believe is a fact, that the entire world was flooded, except for the two peaks of Pushtak, a place that today many people refer to as Mount Diablo. <laughs> many of you might know that place, right? We call it the place of the day. We call it Pushtak. And our elders tell us that when the entire world was flooded, that everything was flooded except for the two peaks of that mountain. And it was there, on that mountain, that Maya, Coyote, created our people after the waters receded. But we weren't the first thing created, though. After the waters receded, the land was created. And there were, well, before there were humans, there were other people that were here, we believe, as well. So we're not the center of it all, either, you know? But our people, though, have lived in the East Bay undeniably since the beginning, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know is how living and how real those connections still are. And I can say, and I say this with a lot of pride, that no generation of my family, no generation, has ever lived away from the East Bay. Every generation, from those ancient times to where we're at today, has lived right in that space that we now call the East Bay. And even in spite of the missions and people being forced from their villages and the hills, people were still living on missions in the East Bay, Mission San Jose, just in Fremont, never moved away from home. And as, given, as soon as given that chance, people moved right back to where those old villages were at. So where our community still lives at today is right in our oldest tribal area, along San Leandro and San Lorenzo Creeks. Our people lived a settled way of life in the Bay Area for millennia. So we didn't just, you know, wander around. It wasn't anything like that, you know. We didn't just pick a berry here and there and just hope, you know, that it, was, it wasn't toxic, you know. <laughs> but people lived a settled way of life for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Too many years to ever count. And our people stewarded the earth. They stewarded the earth so that we lived in balance with the world around us. And our people lived in a densely populated human civilization. And we use this term civilization because that's what our people came from. A lot of intelligence, uh, we had our own institutions, institutionalized religion, centralized political leadership, roundhouses, capitals, all these things that make up a dense human population and civilization right here in the Bay Area. Many people don't know this. But anywhere north of Mexico City, you all heard of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, right? Anywhere north of that big capital of Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, where the Aztecs are at, the biggest population after that of American Indian people is right here in the Bay Area. In the entire continent of North America. The entire continent, north of Mexico City. Now, you think, wow, why didn't we know about this, right? Look around, though. You see this weather, right? You see all the water. I mean, it's a little cold in Pacifica compared to the East Bay. But you see this water, you see the resources, the abundance that's here. This abundance, it's no secret. This allowed civilizations and people to be able to thrive here for millennia. And because of that, our people were able to live here in balance, but also that balance was necessary because you needed to stimulate the plants that you wanted. You couldn't overgather because that would destroy very delicate ecosystems. You had to leave enough for the animals. You had to leave enough for your neighbors, for other people around you. And it wasn't just about just you know taking whatever you could, but it's about living in balance and being a good steward of these places. Our ancestors come from independent tribal nations throughout the East Bay. 
Um, and so what you see right here, these names, my family specifically comes from this area right here, where the mouse is at, Hawkin Irhin. And if you see, there's, it's hard to see, but there's two waterways that are here. That's San, Le that's San Leandro Creek right here, going up into Oakland Hills. This is San Lorenzo Creek right here. We live right about here, and it's where the mouse is at. And so that shows you how close that our people still live to these old areas that were still right there. That's persistence right there, you know, that's not defeat. To be able to live in those same areas that our ancestors have always lived in, we take extreme pride in that. But just because these nations were around and they're small, it doesn't mean that people weren't talking to their neighbors, you know? People had to live in a very, very, very interconnected world as well, where in each of these different nations, you have trade, you have marriage, you have ceremonies, you have people who are going back and forth and interacting with one another. But also, just to show you how different people could be, you also have different languages that are there, different political systems that are there. You have huge differences that exist too. So if you look like right here, you see like where it says Huchu, right here on the, this is where Oakland's at today, North, uh, West Oakland. But if you see this big ridge, this is the Berkeley Hills right here, the Oakland Berkeley Hills. If you just simply cross over the hills from the flatlands, into where Orinda Lafayette's at today, that's an entirely different language where people didn't even speak the same language at all. It's a Miwok language on the eastern side of the bay and a Maloney language on the western side of the hills. And that also shows you how much diversity is within these small areas, but also how people were allowed to and able to coexist for thousands of years in spite of these differences. In fact, where Saklan's at right here, and where Hokkien's at, the people from Hokkien spoke an Ohlone language, Chochenyo. The people from Saklan spoke a Bay Miwok language. And right here, in these two areas, I have ancestry that came from both, where people, where a husband and a wife are married, probably speaking two different languages, but because of this abundance that's here, it made people often speak two or even three languages, sometimes even more. You go over to Marin, people speak a different language. You go a little bit into the Central Valley, where Brentwood's at, people are speaking a Yokut's language. You're right here in the peninsula, people are speaking the Ramatush language, a sister language to our language, but also a different language of its own, too. It just shows you how much diversity and how much abundance is within these spaces. Also, to humanize these people that we come from, I wanna say that we descend our community today we descend from basket weavers, fishermen, herbalists, orators, singers and doctors, religious leaders, shell mound builders, captains and dreamers, and much, much, much more. And I say these things because I want people who are here listening to be able to humanize those people of the past. One of the hardest things for Ohlone people today is when we see how dehumanized our people can be, especially our ancestors, when they're removed from their burial places, when there's construction that happens, people often don't remember that these are people that had families, people who love them, people who are still alive today that directly descend from those people. And so we always want to humanize the intelligence, that sophistication that we know that we come from as well. These are some of the very earliest images of Makmuekma, our people. And if you look at these images, they were painted in the late 1700s by an artist named Louis Chorus. And they were painted not far from here, um, in the East Bay and also at San Francisco. And if you look at these images, you see things that our people still recognize, even today. Like on the image on the left. You see our people weaving a tulip boat, or having a, a sailing on a tulip boat. Believe it or not, Ohlone people still make tulip boats even today. Sometimes when I'm on a bridge, you know, I look down and I think, gosh, this would be so much faster if we were just on a tulip boat. <laughs> <laughs> There's even some Ohlone people who make tulip boats and put surfboards underneath them and then tuli over that so that they sail a little faster too. So there's all kinds of things that people, but there's also people who make them just in the traditional way and who sail around in the traditional way as well. So it's just important to know that this is still being made, that these moats are still made even to this day. And 
If you look on the back, you see baskets, beautiful Ohlone baskets. And Ohlone people, even to this day, still leave our baskets. Our basketry, just like our food, has been revived. However, if you ask a lot of people, anthropologists, when did our baskets stop, or when did Ohlone baskets stop being woven? They'll say, oh, when the missions came 200 years ago, you know, 240 years ago. That's not true, though. I have an auntie, her name's Aunt Dottie. You'll see a picture of her in just a few minutes. She's so cool, though. She's in her 80s. She's like such a hero. She, she heard our language. She, she ate these foods that we ate today when she was a young girl. And she also saw our baskets. And I asked her, I said, you saw our, our feathered baskets? And she said, yes, Auntie Cecilia had a bunch of them in her house. And I said, did she make them? She said, yeah, I saw her weaving those baskets. The feathered Ohlone baskets that she saw in her lifetime. She's 80, 85, so that's when she was a young girl. But that's not that long ago in the big scheme of things. You know, 85 years old, that's, that's a short amount in the big scheme of things. And. And so, um, so my aunt Dottie, she saw these baskets. And so, if you ever hear anybody say Ohlone baskets or they're not they're not woven anymore, or that that stopped being done a long time ago, just call them out on that. Say that's not true. <laughs> Vincent said you're wrong. <laughs> Ohlone baskets are still around, and the feather baskets are still woven today too by uh, by people like in our community, like Linda Yamane, who's a renowned basket weaver who worked in her adult life to revive Ohlone basketry. And now people like Lewis are learning twining and feathered basketry as well. So it shows how this all keeps going. We see those baskets in the back though, something that we recognize. We see our people taking care of an elder, something that's central in our culture. In our culture, we always take care of our older people. That's just something that we are raised with. And when we look at this, we say, huh, those are two, those are two very proper guys right there taking care of their <laughs> elder. You know? And then also, if you look on the other side, you see things that again we still recognize even today. These are people in what we call regalia, which is uh, which is what people wear before they go into ceremony. And right here, the regalia that you see, those are still things that are worn in our dances and our ceremonies in the roundhouse even in 2019. The flicker feathered headbands that you see there, people still wear those even nowadays. The crow feather skirts that you see, people still dance in those even today. The top knots that you see sticking out of their, um, out of the hairnet on the, of their head, those top knots are still made, still worn, still danced in. The body paints, people still dance in those as well. So when Ohlone people look at these things today, we see people that we still recognize. We see people that we see during ceremony, that these things are still very much alive. Then there's a very different image that's here, painted by the exact same person, Louis Torres. And this is over in San Francisco, in the Presidio. And I named this one, Iyanukne Yasotaukma when the others came. Now you look at what you see here, and you see our people again, but under very different circumstances, being forced to work in slavery and bondage against our wishes. You see the Spanish soldiers right here with lances. Those lances were always armed. They weren't just sticks, but they had points, and people could die from those. You see the Presidio in the background that's still there today? Right here, you see the Golden Gate. Hmm. Now, around, that's Marin right there. Now, when we see this, we feel something much different because we know any of these people, because both mine and Lewis's ancestors were at Mission Dolores, enslaved at Mission Dolores, are direct people. So we know that some of those people could easily be them. Now, we see these images, and it's hard to look at these images, to look at how dehumanizing that how people are dehumanizing our people, how they're being forced to work, how they couldn't go back to their old villages. And this began the very earliest stages of colonization and invasion here in our homelands. And we have endured and survived many hardships in our history. And I say survived because that's very important to understanding what I'm gonna talk about next. But beginning in the late 1700s, 
the, the very late 1700s. Like the Spanish first arrived here in this area in 1776. They claimed it much earlier without really caring much that there were already people living here, settled boundaries and territories and all of that. But in the late 1700s, in 1776, they made this really concrete, determined effort, the Spanish, to, to try to um, colonize California. Can you all hear me okay? Should I use the microphone? Yeah. Okay, I'm just checking. I got a loud mouth, so, okay. So during this time, the Spanish government, the way that they decided to colonize California and to interact with our people, was they decided to, to establish a string of missions, the California mission system, that goes from Sonoma all the way down to San Diego. They came to the Bay Area much later, though. And when we talk about California being colonized, I want people just to also understand that it wasn't that long ago that California was colonized. My great-grandmother's great-grandfather was born in a pre-contact village, unaffected by colonization. So that just shows you how close this all is, you know? When we talk about 500 years ago, they're talking in Mexico and, you know, the Caribbean. When you're talking 400 years ago, you're talking about the East Coast. California was one of the last places to really be colonized. And so because of that, all of this is still so real, it's so raw, and so it's affecting us still in tangible ways. But the Spanish government, they attempted to missionize our ancestors. And essentially what they did was they forced people from our villages in the East Bay, but all throughout the, area, all throughout the areas where they were coming, they forced people from their villages and into these missions. There's 21 missions, our people were first forced to mission, uh, uh, mission uh, Dolores in San Francisco, and then after mission San Jose in Fremont. But in these places, the Spanish, they were attempting to, to take Indian people off of the land to remove our people so that they could take the land for themselves, for their cattle, for their ranchos, for their houses, for their pueblos. And they didn't care much that we were already living in these places. But in spite of what people are told, this wasn't a choice that people came to voluntarily. It's very well documented, both through old stories, but also through the Spanish old records. What they would do is they would often round up and, and um, go into villages, take babies, children, young people, take those people against the parents' wishes into the mission system, and after that, the parents would understandably go to get their children. After they were into the missions, though, they had to be baptized. And after you're baptized, you couldn't leave those places. You were forced to stay there. Keep in mind, people didn't understand what baptism was. Like, this is an entirely foreign concept to us back then. People didn't understand what it meant. You know, they didn't speak Spanish. Um, and they also didn't understand that they couldn't leave after they were, after they were uh, baptized. So in these missions, the Spanish, they attempted to suppress every bit of our traditional culture. They try to take our language from us. They, there's quotes from Junipero Serra that if we stopped, if we wouldn't stop speaking our language, Junipero Serra said in a quote, to, uh, to issue blows that are as old as the conquest, meaning to beat our people until we wouldn't stop, until we would stop speaking it. Our people couldn't practice our religion, couldn't go back to those old villages. Our names were banned. The traditional marriage structures were banned. And there was huge amounts of violence against our people, including um, huge amounts of rape that's documented as well. During this time, our people were living in extreme hardship. And to make matters worse, disease spread very quickly because our people had no immunity to European diseases. And so after the missions, a huge number of our people died as a result of violence from the Spanish European diseases. Um, but there were people, though, who did survive this. We want to acknowledge that many people didn't survive this difficult period in our history. It was needless death. There was no reason for it. But after Spain was here, which was relatively a short time, you know, in spite of the destruction that was caused, it was only 65 years that they were here in charge of California. And after they were here, it wasn't because they just left one day, but it was because in the 1820s, there was a war in Mexico, the Mexican uh, War of Independence, where Mexico 
fought a war against the Spanish Empire. They were successful in that war, but because this was part of the Spanish Empire here in California, what's called Alta California, then they, um, Mexico then raised their flag one day over California. Our people didn't know, you know, we were still forced in the missions. One day you just see a different flag. And at this point, the Mexican government, after expelling the Spanish authorities, keep in mind they're pretty much the same people at this point too. Like, there's not like a distinct Mexican identity at that point. It's still pretty much just a continuation of the Spanish imperialist regime. But during that time, the Mexican government then told our people, who are in the missions at this point for over 50 years, you're free now. You can leave the missions. Go back to your villages. Leave the missions. Go back, go back home. Get out of here now, basically. The reason why they were saying this, though, wasn't because they cared suddenly about Indian people. It wasn't because they wished us well or they wanted us to go back and go back to our traditional way of life. But the Mexican government was broke. They were bankrupt. After this wealthy uh, or this expensive war with Spain, they had no money. And one of the only places in California that they could be able to get resources for money was in the missions. Because the missions, after all that Indian labor, turned out to be really profitable, you know? And, um, you know, again, it wasn't something that our people really got much benefit from, but our people were making those places profitable of all that labor and all the work that our people put in. But then the Mexican government said, go back, go back to those old villages. During that time, they got all the gold, the silver, the things that were supposed to eventually be given back to our people, and they took those and they sold them. When our people tried to go back to those old villages, we couldn't go back to them because during that time, they were on private property. They were part of these big uh, land grants called ranchos where suddenly, if our people try to go back to where our villages were at, you might have somebody like a Peralta or a Vallejo going up and trying to shoot you or kill you just for going onto your land. There's a phrase in our, in our family that Vallejo stole until he grew old because that man wouldn't stop stealing from us. And even into the Mexican period, when somebody went to go and see how our people were being treated and official from the government, Vallejo took even the, the, the clothing that was supposed to be allocated for the woman, sold that, left people naked, and people were there screaming out for hunger because Vallejo took every bit of the resource that was supposed to go back to our people and made his own profit off of that himself. During that time, our people just had to find a way to make do. And one of the only ways that our people could do that during this time was to go into hiding. And during that time, our family did that. They went into hiding in a canyon over in Sanol, which is on the other side of the bay from here, just on the, on the other side of the hills from Fremont. And if anybody's here ever been to Sanol, it's a very beautiful place, but it's a mountainous place. It's like deep canyons, it's remote, it's isolated. But that's where our culture was able to be protected. And in that place, away from you know, all of the development that was happening from the Mexicans and later the Americans, our family was able to have a place of refuge. And this is from the 1860s going up until 1927. On that place of refuge, in spite of all the conditions that our people faced during the missions, during that Mexican period, our people then made this determined effort on that land base to go back to our traditional culture. What that meant is that the roundhouse, the traditional religious structure, was rebuilt there. And we even sent our, people, our ancestors even sent out missionaries, Indian missionaries, to go and take away the religion imposed on our people and, and uh, preach uh, Indian religion to those people so that they would go back to our traditional religion. Our traditional religious structures were revived there after being suppressed in the missions. Our traditional political structures of having a male Wedrish, a political leader, a captain, and a female Mayan, a religious leader, also uh, a leader in the, in the community, where their powers were combined, was reintroduced on the Rancheria in Sinol. That was banned during the missions, because we were too forward-thinking, apparently, for the Spanish. <laughs> um, during that time, also, 
our people took back our traditional names. They left their Western names behind very often and went back to traditional names. Our language began to be strengthened on the Rancheria because we weren't being hit and abused for speaking it in the missions anymore. So people went back like that to speaking our language, even documenting thousands of pages of it and recording our, voice, our people's voices on old wax cylinder recordings. Our stories were told there, our dances were held, all of these things kept going. And it was, it's a reminder that when our people could go back to our traditional culture immediately, people did. And during that time, our people also were able to negotiate federal recognition. I'll talk about that in just a moment. However, outside of this rancheria, things weren't perfect because in spite of the community that was built there, things were getting drastically worse politically around us. Now, Mexico was only in charge of California for even a shorter time in Spain, about 15 to 20 years. After that, you all know what happens next. There was Manifest Destiny, and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed after the Mexican-American War, the 1840s. Suddenly, the United States claims California, okay? Now, all these things that have happened, you know, from the 1700s until that point, got drastically worse when Americans took over California. The reason why, this is a quote, you could look it up. The very first American governor of California, Peter Burnett, said in his first address to the state government, it's inevitable that there has to be a war of extermination against the Indian race until the race becomes extinct. They were talking about our people, California Indians, specifically. And during this time in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, up until the 1890s, the state of California waged a campaign of genocide against our people. And I say genocide very literally because there's bonds that the government issued to people who would kill our people. The government would allocate money so that Indian people were killed and murdered, and they called it, uh, they, they, what was the name that they called it for the Indian, uh, for Indian removal, yes, that's what they called it. But that meant not removal from the land, but removal in every way possible for them. During this time, our people had no rights to vote. If somebody tried, we were born citizens. Our people, if somebody killed our people because it was legal, it means that they could get free labor for them by taking, uh, by stealing the child. The children would be raised to be uh, brought up into these, these white homes where they were treated terribly and where they were slaves. This got even further institutionalized. In 1880, with a law that passed called the Protection of the California Indians, a law that gave us no protection, which I think is some kind of a sick joke the way that it was titled, because the law essentially legalized Indian servitude, Indian slavery here in California. And what it said was that if there was an Indian person who was not working for a white person, that they could be held um, either in prison or they could be released to a white person to work on their property, to work on their land without pay. What that is is slavery. During that time, if you wanted, uh, people wanted to get a, a younger person, they would kill the parents. Nobody could testify in courts. You kill the parents, you take the child. The child was raised in these terrible conditions, forced to work. This didn't change until the early 1900s. You know, slavery and the way that people think about it in the South didn't happen, you know, in that same fashion with, uh, you know, with African Americans in this area, but it happened to our people, without a doubt. And there's passages in the old notes that our people record. Angela de los Colos, the woman that you see right there on the top, she recorded in 1921 that in Martinez, which is just in the East Bay, that when she was a, a young person, she saw Indian children stripped naked on a cart, screaming out for water, about to be sold into slavery. And she tells the story because she wanted these things to be remembered, you know, not forgotten about. You don't tell things like that with that much pain, you know, because you, you don't care about those things. It's important to know the truth if we want to move forward, if we want to heal, reconcile. We have to be aware of what's happened here. And it's no doubt that our people were killed in big numbers. 
Angela de los Colos, she also named the person who was driving the wagon, a reminder that those people always need to be held accountable. We think about those things even today. During this time, when our family had federal recognition, we were protected from a lot of the worst abuses that were happening. However, things did start to take a turn in the 1920s. Some of you might know of an anthropologist or heard of him named Alfred Kroeber. Does that name sound familiar to some people? Alfred Kroeber, anthropologist over at UC Berkeley. And Alfred Kroeber, for being an educated, supposedly a learned person, he, he did something that was very uh, harmful to our people, where he decided to make this book called The Handbook of California Indians. And what he decided to do was to try to compile every single tribe in California, which was like, just on its own, not a very good idea, because, you know, like, let's look back at this map right here. That's just the East Bay. If you imagine California, how are you going to compile every single tribe in California? But he tried. And what he was looking at, though, was he was a purist. So he was only looking at Indian cultures if they could remember people, if they could remember things from before colonization, before invasion. But by the time he interviewed our people, you know, we were already 150 years deep into colonization. You know, people were, had to be savvy, you know, had to learn how to interact with white folks around them, learn how to be able to keep our culture alive, you know, learn how to work in this, in this society, you know, that was very different than what their grandparents were born into. And they did, which shows like a living people. But Alfred, that wasn't good enough for Alfred Kroeber. Okay. He said that the Ohlone people, back then they called us the Costanoans, that the Ohlone people, for all practical purposes, are extinct. extinct. Yes. But then he goes on to just kind of add salt in the wound, you know? He said, but there are some scattered individuals, some scattered communities, mostly connected to Mission San Jose, that's us, the East Bay. Mission San Juan Batista, that's the Moonson people, Gilroy area, and Mission San Carlos, that's Lewis's people, Carmel. Those are, without a doubt, the three main Ohlone communities that have persisted. With now, there's other people who have since you know been identified as Ramatush, as Tamian, you know, as um, as Chalon. But for a long time, uh, those were the three known Ohlone communities. And that's why we get really defensive over our culture, because there's a really long track record of us defending these things. But Alfred Kroeber later went on to apologize for that, you know, in the 1940s, but it was too little, too late. Because, as I'm sure you all know, words matter, right? right. And two years after he said that, there was an Indian agent. I might have mentioned a rogue Indian agent. We know this because he acted on his own. He was also known to be an alcoholic too. But his name was Alfred, or excuse me, Lafayette Dorrington. And I mention these things because he, this guy wasn't, through everything I've learned about this guy, he wasn't like, you know, the, he wasn't a, a good guy. He wasn't looking after our people. He wasn't looking after his job. He was looking after ways to be able to make his own profit, make his own benefit. And what Lafayette Dorrington did was he was just itching for a way to remove us from the list of recognized tribes. Why? Because suddenly development in the Bay Area started to get more and more. And you know, these, these Indian people, you know, they have some land over there, right? So they want to try to get that land, the little bit of land that we that our people had, the one or two acres, whatever it was. So Lafayette Dorrington, he read this passage from, from Alfred Kroeber. Two years later, without even visiting our conditions, without visiting where our great-grandparents were living on the land, without visiting the or, or understanding the hardships, the racism, the discrimination that existed, he decided to say the Verona Band of Alameda County, you know, that's us, the people before Moekma, the Verona Band of Alameda County is in no need of land. And as a result, without any consent from Congress, without any ratification, without any, any um, consulting our tribe, unilaterally decided to take us off the list of recognized tribes on his own. And ever since then, our people have been working since 1927 to repair that, almost 100 years. But what that did 
that little protected bit of land that we had, where our people had some safety from the worst bits of violence around us, was suddenly revoked, taken from us. So what did people have to do? They had to leave that land base and find ways to just survive in a society that was bent on destroying us, even at that point, in the 1920s. It essentially made our people refugees within our own homeland. And why do I say that? I mean that literally, because people went and hired Indian people during that time. We couldn't practice our religion until the 1970s legally. People wouldn't rent to Indian people during that time because of the discrimination that existed. For it was very, very, very unpopular for people to even associate with the Lomi people during this time in the 1920s. And during this time, our family, our elders, our great-grandparents had to find ways to just survive at a time when it seemed like there were many different odds that our people were facing. But our people did survive. Our great-grandparents worked hard. They worked on orchards, picking prunes. A lot of them had to move around to different apartments to where, to where people would rent to them, not making a lot of money, but still staying within our homeland and keeping our families close and our families strong. And family has been one of those things that has always been able to keep our identity alive. Because our people, even to this day, our family structures, they keep these things going. During that time, our family did survive that. But it wasn't without a lot of hardship and a lot of difficulty. During that time as well, our people, um, our people we're still able to carry on our culture in spite of having to work so hard, in spite of having to find ways to survive. People carried on our identity, our stories, our language as long as they could. Everything that they could remember, they carried on. And that's how these things could still be alive. And it reminds me that in spite of the hardships, our people have never left, our people have never lost our dignity, our pride. Being able to survive through these hardships that's a testament to the strength of those people before us. And we always give them extreme gratitude because there they went through things that we can never fully understand. But they did that because they knew that one day things would get better. You know, they didn't just give up. They found ways to keep all of this strong because they knew that there would be a, a lonely people one day in the future. And that we would have to carry on these things too. That's why this is also important to us because we want to honor those sacrifices, recognize those sacrifices, and not ever forget those things, but also work so that the hopes that our, our ancestors and our elders have, that those things will be able to continue forever. Now, while that is a difficult story, a lot of this, I'd like to focus on some facts that are very, very, very good. And these things right here are undisputable. Our people have never left home, and the overwhelming, excuse me, the overwhelming majority of our tribal members in Moekma still live right in the East Bay. We keep our families strong, and we keep what was passed down to us close to our hearts. Not everything has to be revived. Our land, that connection has never been lost. Our identity has never been lost. Our elders, they still tell stories that were passed down to them from their parents. And like, those, like an example of this is one day it was raining really hard. And there's one member of our tribe today, Hank Alvarez, who's the very last member of Moekma, our current day tribe, that was also a member of Verona Band, the old tribe that all of our people were once a part of. He's the very last member of that tribe, of Verona Band. When I was a kid, there were dozens of people. Now there's just one, though. That's also very sad to see, because it makes us question how long do we have to wait you know, before we get recognized as a federally recognized sovereign tribe. But when it gets rain, really rainy out, um, Uncle Hank, he'll start to share stories. And one day when it was rainy, he started to talk about when all the world was covered with water, except for the two islands on the peak of Tushtak. Mount Diablo. And this is a reminder of how close this all is. That story was told to him by his mom. That was told to her by her mom, who was born on the Rancheria. That was told to her by her mom, who was born in a pre-contact village. It's all so close to us. It's not far at all. 
We revive and we strengthen what was taken from us. So not everything could be carried on. You know, when our people were forced to find work, to, you know, when it wasn't safe to be a lonely, how could our people go up in the hills to gather sedge when, you know, that could be private property? How could our people go and gather acorn when they could be killed just for doing so? So not everything could be carried on, including our language for a short time. But one of the most powerful things about this is the intelligence and the foresight that our ancestors had because one day they knew that our people would need to be able to rebuild our culture after it was suppressed for so long. So what our people did was they sat down and they recorded thousands of pages just like that. Thousands of pages of language information, how to revive our language. This is all recorded in the 1920s and early 1930s how to revive our language, the grammar of our language, the syntax. They recorded our old stories. They recorded our values, jokes. They talked about the injustices that they faced. They shared gossip about some, some other people. They shared all these things because they knew that one day in the future, Ohlone people would still be here, and we would need to be able to rebuild and heal from the things that have happened. And so today, we take those words off of the paper, and this is something that's happened in the past. Our language has been revived. So now our language is spoken fluently by young people and elders alike. We're very proud of that. But this is what the pages look like, handwritten notes. One of the powerful things is we also get recipes from our ancestors as well. They teach us how to make these foods, where to gather them. Sometimes they'll even talk about how much they miss those foods, like in Lewis's family, where this is about meadows. One of the other things is we get to hear their voices, our old wax cylinder recordings. These grainy old recordings that were taken in the 1920s, where we literally hear the people before us speaking and singing. And through that, we can be able to revive those old songs again. We get to hear those voices. Sometimes even like hear their laughter and that kind of stuff. You know, makes you feel so connected. We continue to fight for our federal reaffirmation. So while our tribe's recognition was taken from us in 1927, my entire adult life, my tribe, excuse me, my entire life, excuse me, my, uh, my tribe has been working to repair that, that, um, that misdeed, that, that effort. And since uh, the early 1980s, the original members of Moekma of the Barona of Alameda County reorganized Moekma with all of the East Bay and South Bay Ohlone lineages that, that continue to survive. And since the 1980s, our tribe has taken a very different approach to federal recognition. And our tribe sued the government because we realized that we had no need to stand in line for 30 years to be a federally recognized tribe because we were already federally recognized, and that was taken away from us without our consent, without Congress's consent either. So our tribe sued the government and said, we're Muwekma, we're the successor to the Verona Band, and we don't understand why we're not recognized. We actually won that lawsuit. The government said, you should be recognized. You have, there's no reason you shouldn't be recognized. You meet all the criteria, and you are indeed the successor to the Verona Band of Alameda County. All your members descend from those people, no question. We, we won that lawsuit. They said to us, they directed the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, to look at our case next. So it was expedited, and it would just be this very quick administrative fix. We would be a federally recognized tribe within the next year or so, they said at that point. However, this is where it gets confusing. The same people who are fighting us in, in court, our tribe in court, were the same exact people who were reviewing our federal recognition application. And the only reason that they said that we couldn't be a recognized tribe was they said, you are indeed the successor to the Verona Band. You are indeed 100% of your of Muekma tribal members are East Bay Ohlone people. Also, they, were all, they all come from people who are a member of the Verona Band. You all still live together. You, have, you form a community. You're distinct. You have all these things. However, for 30 years, in between 1930 and 1960, you had no formal governments. 
And our people said, but you took away our recognition. We had to find work. We had to find ways to survive. And we did. And in spite of that, our people still did keep a government. Our people, at our, our um, elders, at every single function they would have, whether it be a funeral, a baptism, a wedding, a family meeting, they would keep roll sheets about who was present, what was discussed, what was discussed affecting the community. Because one day they knew that you know, we would need those things. The government wouldn't accept those though. So we're still currently in the process of, of uh, going through recognition. It's not over, I'm sure it won't be over anytime soon, but I also know that this will be carried on. One day we will be a recognized tribe. But in the process, whether or not the government recognizes us, we recognize ourselves, you know? We also know that the land, the East Bay recognizes us, you know? We've been there since the start. So no matter what, our culture is going to continue. But federal recognition is a very important tool to help us be able to maneuver and navigate through this modern day you know, system that we're in. I, um, there was a friend of ours who said, you know, if Indian people had GoPros from the very beginning to where we're at now and sent that all to the government, they still wouldn't, you know. <laughs> so so we, we still, you know, we know that there's a battle ahead, but we also know that we're not going to stop caring for these things or stop in these efforts. And about that, we continue to care for and tend to the land that we come from. Those obligations weren't lost. We still remember these things. That's why we're still in these places, because of that love that we have. I mean, can you imagine in one small place, every bit of your culture coming from that place, your language, all your family living there for thousands of years, you know, every bit of your stories being said in that place, waking up and seeing the mountain that your elders tell you, that you were created on, that your world was created on, you know, that you still believe. You know, all those things mean that there's a love that we have for these areas, for me, for the East Bay, in a way that we can never describe. You know, a love that goes too deep to ever, you know, have words that will go with that. So because of that, we always have to be good to these places, to be responsible, and to always protect those places. That means looking after our waterways, looking after the bay, making sure the tulis growing good, making sure that when we gather our plants that we don't overgather, making sure we protect our ancestors who are in the ground, making sure that the shell mounds are protected. All these things are real, and they have a real impact on our culture, on our, on our future too. This is the hope, right here, okay? This is my dad's sister's daughter, my cousin Tara. And this is such a cool image because this just shows what Ohlone children today are growing up with. When I was a kid, and when Lewis was a kid, we knew of our identity, we knew of where we came from, and we knew a lot of our elders who kept these stories strong. But today, to see the things that Ohlone children are growing up with, it's amazing. Ohlone kids are growing up with our language. They're growing up with using slang with one another in our language, too. They're growing up with being able to tell our stories, eating our foods, being in our homeland, making our arts. That's making clamshell beads right there. These kids are just growing up so empowered with everything right now, where it shows when we work to decolonize, to repair the wounds of colonization, and we do it together as a community, we can be able to accomplish a whole lot in a relatively short time. And this is only possible, again, because of those people before. We're doing what we can in our time, but those people before are what make it possible. Our elders. This is an image of why we're wanting to do this food work. You know, this food work that we're doing here, it's to be able to return these things back to our people. You know, so in the future, no Ohlone child will ever have to question what our food tastes like, what our language sounds like. You know, that they just grow up with these things empowered. This is at a big meal that we had for, what was it, 200 people? Uh, we hosted this big, we, we host these big meals for tribal people in our community. And this was at the Intertribal Friendship House in Oakland, a place that my great grandmother, Mary Archuleta, was instrumental in, in establishing. And that's serving a traditional acorn bread right there, one of our oldest foods, to this native kid that's right there. 
And you know, you see just how cool this looks. This is like a contemporary identity. You see the basket hat and the jean jacket? That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> but this is what contemporary identity looks like for us. And we're so proud to see these things happen. We can only do this work because of our elders. This is Lewis and his elder, Gloria Castro. Um, and that's over in Hulking, the area in the East Bay where my family comes from. And if you look, they're taking a walk together, and Gloria's talking about the plants that she gathered when she was a young girl. She also talks about the earth ovens that she saw dug, about the language, the Rumson language that she heard spoken. And then she gets to see all these things respected nowadays. She gets to see these things come back stronger. She gets to eat these foods whenever she wants now. She gets to brag to her people, you know, that all these things are doing good. And it makes us feel good to be able to see the happiness that this brings our elders. You know, our, our elders, like my Aunt Dottie, they saw these things when they were young people. They saw these foods, they, they heard our language. They saw all of these things being practiced. And then, because of how hard colonization came, they also, in their lifetime, saw these things stop being practiced. We never say that they died, we say that they went to sleep. When, they, when something goes to sleep, with the right effort, you can wake it back up and have it again. Our language, our food, all of these things were never dead, but they were sleeping. And now they're all reawakened again. And so it makes us feel so proud for our elders to get to see how happy they are to have these things back in their lives again. They always, when they, when they talk about these things, they always perk up, they smile a little more, you know, they, they always like tug on their lapels when they come to the cafe. And it just makes you feel so proud, you know, to be a part of that. Because only because of them can we be able to do these things. And just to end, that's my great grandmother again, Mary Archuleta, and that's me when I was a kid. <laughs> but this again, just to end with this, some final thoughts. This shows that continuity that exists. We learn these things from our people from before. And it's those people from before that we want to make proud, that we want to make sure that they're respected, that the work that they did, that those things were never, for, that they were never in vain, you know, that they were never just done just because, but that those things are respected. And one thing that Lewis and I talk about a lot, and the way that I see things in my eyes, Lewis's eyes, is, you know, we're in this current moment right now. We're in 2019, right? But for us, on one side of us, you know, there's a, there's, there's a line that goes too far to ever see the end. If you could just imagine an imaginary line of all these people lined up one after another, and it's just going and going and going, and you can never see the end of it. And those are our ancestors, the people that we come from. And on the other side, there's another line that's just as long, that goes and goes and goes and goes, and you can't see the end of that either. And that's the future generation of Ohlone people that are yet to come. And we're just right there, right now, in this current day moment. But we have the capacity to make these things stronger, make that knowledge that was carried on, make the wisdom that was carried on, our language, our foods, our identity. We can make those things stronger, or we can make those things weaker, just depending on our actions. And we're determined, completely determined, clear-sighted, that we want to make our culture and our identity stronger. We want to be able to make it easier for those people who are coming, and to be able to make those people that we come from proud, to always make sure that they're central to this work, that they're never forgotten about, and that our culture can live forever. That's what we're seeing right now. That's what these foods represent. And I also hope that, just for one final remark I want to share, I hope that you can, that you can understand Ohlone culture through a, a different way after hearing some of these words. Because very often our culture is associated with defeat. And when I was, um, a few years ago, I was working at Mission Dolores. I worked there for seven years as one of the, one of the curators there. And I worked really hard to try to change that story how it was told, so it was more fair. Because when I was a kid, I had to hear the unfair story. It didn't feel good, you know? So I wanted to try to change that. And there was a 
But a kid who asked me one day, he didn't really know anything about California history. He was just starting the missions, and he said, so who won? You know, he just basically wanted to know, you know, who won, the Ohlone or the Spanish? And I said, well, where I live at today, I live in the same area that all of my ancestors have always lived at, same exact space. You know, I, I speak my language at home every day. I grew up knowing I'm Ohlone. You know, my culture is very strong today. You know, the Spanish, they're not here anymore. <laughs> you know, but, but we're still here, right? <laughs> So, if you think about it that way, uh, we won. Uh, <laughs>